It is a pleasure to be joined right now by New York Ranger legend Brian Leach. Oh, come on, for me, Leach, for me, this is a huge deal. I, up, I was 14 in 94. I remember the parade. I was in junior high school. You guys are like my idols. So anytime I get a chance to talk to a member of the 94 Rangers, it's a thrill, and I've never spoken to you before. Now, of course, you guys are having an anniversary here. Join Messier. The Rangers 94 Stanley Cup championship team, including Brian Leach, Mike Richter, Adam Graves, Stefan Mateau, Mike Keenan at the Woodbridge Brewery, 33rd Main Street in Woodbridge, New Jersey, Saturday, September 21st. Visit Hall of Fame Signings.com or CXStuff.com for details to purchase tickets. All right. Can you believe it's been 30 years, Brian, since you guys have hoisted the Stanley Cup? I know. I just been thinking about it recently because I knew this was event was coming up, and I'm getting to see some of my teammates that I haven't seen in a number of years. And uh, it's interesting because I wasn't married at the time, and now I've got uh, three kids, almost all gone out of the house, and one 18 year old uh, high school senior left. So sometimes when you watch your kids grow up, uh, it goes faster. But to have a 30 year anniversary of such a special year um, in my career, it's amazing. Who are some of the guys that you've stayed in touch with the most from that team over the years? Well, probably just the guys that were working, like Pukaboom was working for the Rangers when I was there. Graves still working for the Rangers. Mess and Richter are in the area. But otherwise, it's only when we get together for some charity events or, you know, a retirement jersey or something that the Garden has us, you know, all back for. But otherwise, you know, we're, we're all in a tech string. Um, so we will hit that every now and then, but we really don't we really don't see each other as much as uh, you would think. You know, I'm not a fan of of group chats, but the 94 Rangers <laughs> group chat it doesn't get much better than that, Brian. <laughs> and we don't and we don't hit it very often, to be honest with you. It's usually right. it's usually just when you're checking in on someone that you know you heard is getting this you know procedure done and. Then everybody gets back to, oh, we got to get back together. We got to put, you know, a, a reunion together at some point. Everyone says, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it never happens. So the fact it's happening, you know, we're going to have a couple good days of, of golf and dinners afterwards. So it'll be a fun few days for all of us. That is awesome. So where are you at now? What are you doing now? With Are you, are you in hockey at all? Are you following the Rangers? Where are you at now? Brian? Yeah. So once I stopped working for the Rangers uh, three years ago, um, I just finishing up coaching my uh, my 18 year old, so that that ended this year. He aged out, and he's with another uh, another team now. So that was keeping me busy. You know, I was in the rink four to five days a week for uh, for most of the winter up until this past year. So right now, just getting some golf in, a little bit of fishing, and a lot of fun. You pay attention to the current Rangers at all? Last year or a couple of years, this core group? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean. That's my activity most nights is watching hockey or watching sports. And, you know, this is one of the best times of year with college and, and pro football and training camp starting with the NHL. We're going to get October baseball coming up. So it's like it's a fun time to be a sports fan. And I root for all the New York teams, but obviously follow um, follow the Rangers closely. So Jacob Truba said, I think it was today, actually, that this might be everybody knows this is the last chance for this core group to, you know, go get that Stanley Cup last two years. Terribly disappointing. While exciting, terribly disappointing. Do you think that this Rangers team can figure out a way to get over that hump with this great goaltender, with the pieces that they have here, this core? Can they get to a Stanley Cup and win a Stanley Cup this year? Well, of course they can. You know, just like we knew they could last year and the year before. Like, they're obviously good enough. But, you know, it's hard. It's hard to win, and it's hard to win four games. Um, when you get into those playoffs and and health goes a long way, but they they ride that power play and they ride their goaltending. And those are two important components, obviously, when you get to the uh, to the playoffs. But um, to, to the guys credit, they know it's hard to keep salaries, you know, intact and keep people together. And when no trade clauses are running out or limited ones are are running out, there's always, you know, a redo. and and movement happens. So it's good for the guys to talk about it like that. But with Shesterkin in net and the power play and the skill they have, they're going to be in the mix, you know, for the playoffs, whatever seating it is. And then it's, you know, you need some breaks and you need to be there in the big moments. 
Yeah, and it's funny you say that because I'm not a hockey expert by any stretch. I love the sport. I love the New York Rangers. I've been watching my whole life. But I wouldn't say that I'm a hockey expert, maybe the way I feel comfortable knowing other sports. But the one thing that you guys taught me, goaltending, power play, right? That's what plays in the postseason, which is why I believed in this Rangers team specifically last year. But maybe to a fault, I compare everybody to the 94 Rangers, whether it's, hey, who's is, is Adam Fox going to be the next Brian Leach? Where's the Leach in Bukaboom? And I just haven't – obviously, we haven't seen it since 1994 when you guys won the Stanley Cup but they have the pieces in place. Do you think, let's say, Adam Fox could take another step forward and become what you were to the Rangers in 1994? I don't think he has to. I think he's at the level that, uh, you know, he's in the, the Norris Trophy voting each year. He's been in the league. Um, he's fine. I think that the thing that people forget about the Ranger team is those moves we made at the end to add size and and toughness and grittiness. and they didn't, Matt Toe, you know, scored some big goals, but he wasn't scoring all the time. And Noonan wasn't scoring all the time. Glenn Anderson wasn't scoring all the time, but they were proven um, tough players. McTavish, we had a lot of guys mm -hmm. that filled in um, at different times on different lines throughout that. So we had, you know, we had Messier, we had obviously the goaltending, we had Zuboff and myself, and we had a core group of, of skill players, but we really added um, to that, and you saw Florida. Florida had that type of team. Yeah. They had top end guys, but they also had, you know, throughout that lineup, um, some tough guys to play against. And at certain points, you're going to rely on those type of players. So I think Chris Drury's always trying to address that. Um, each year at the deadline, he's made moves to try and shore up usually that third and fourth line and those uh, guys to add that. And then they've been close, but. You know, it's it, it takes some breaks and it takes a whole team effort to get to that point. You know, same thing in 94 with those trades, all those trades you referenced. To me, that's like, OK, well, the Rangers did this perfectly back then. Now, all these teams, I want to see them add the final pieces or the, or the finishing pieces, pieces to a championship team. And they all seemingly, whether it's the Mets, whoever it may be, fall short of that. How did those moves go over at the time? I mean, you traded Mike Gartner. You know, there's a Tony Amani, a young uh, possible stud player. You guys traded some good players away, too. How did those moves go over in the locker room back at 94 at the time? Well, all, all character guys. I mean, you're always you're always disappointed when you're having success and you're, you see your teammates moved out and your friends, you know, not getting the opportunity that you might have. We were we were in first place when uh, when those moves were made. So that that's the tough part. But all character guys, you know. Still, some of my best friends that I see, Noonan and Matteo, and yeah, see these guys around. So it's always tough to move people, but when quality and character come in, yeah, you know, they were accepted right away and obviously started contributing right away. All right. So, I mean, I got to ask you about Mike Keenan. He's going to be there. And I know back at the time, now again, I was a 14 year old, Brian, so I don't know all the details. Yeah. I didn't want to hear about it. Just voice that cup, which you guys did. But clearly since then, reading all the books, whether it's the 20th anniversary or just seeing some stuff, it, it seemed like Keaton was very hard on you back then. And maybe you didn't take it the right way initially. Explain to me, and for those of us who don't know what went on behind the scenes, what your relationship was like with Mike Keenan back in 94. Well, Mike, um, his MO when he would come to a new, new team was he liked to, you know, move players that had been there for a number of years and bring in type of players that he liked. For example, his favorite defenseman is Chris Chelios, different type of player than me and one of my best friends. And he he was always trying to, you know, get Neil Smith to move me for Chelios and see if they could do some package. And I don't know, it, it wasn't a great relationship, to be honest. Um, but my teammates were so good. They just tell me to keep playing. Uh, Neil Smith, our GM, said, you're not going anywhere. Don't let it get to you. And, you know, but it, it was strange for me because I've always tried to win for the coach, just like I try and win for my teammates. And at a certain point during that year, I just said, it's all for my teammates and my family and for the fans. Like, I'd had enough of it. So once we got to the playoffs, I said, well, this is this can't continue. But it did keep continuing, which I couldn't believe. But Mike and I have since aired out that year. He doesn't remember it the same way I do, which... It's pretty interesting, but he 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 goes about things a lot different. But I always tell everyone, I go, 
I only have my name on that Stanley Cup once, and his name's on it too. And his is only on there once. So um, we've done some TV together. We've done some events together. We're actually, the signing we're doing on on uh, Saturday, it, we're, we're split up throughout the whole day. And I think I'm with Larmer, Keenan, and myself, which is pretty funny um, to, to do our hour, our, you know, our signing together. But Mike and I have, have spent a lot of time together over the years since then. But it was it was hard for me. Like, uh, I, I'd always try and do what the coaches asked me to do all the time. And it didn't seem like I could please him. So I just said, I'll just play. You know, I'll just play. And if I'm here at the end of the year or the following year, I'll just keep playing to the best I can. And you got the job done, obviously. Man, that is, that is some great insight there to hear it from you. And we had Messier on, I'd say, during the during the playoff run this year. And he talked about what Keenan said before game seven. And I, I feel like in that, I don't remember exactly what Messier said or if he even gave the detail. I read this somewhere else, but something that made it click in, in that particular game, you know, final game, obviously in the year, game seven, Stanley Cup, to where you, even though he was riding you hard, the, the speech that Keenan gave made it known that he loved you guys. What was your take on the speech Keenan gave ahead of game seven of the Stanley Cup final? I can't tell you what the speech was. I, I have no idea, but you got to also remember he was negotiating with other teams to try and to try and leave. That was in the papers as as we were getting to the end. So um, it was a, he was an interesting coach. I loved his practices. Um, I love everything he said. I didn't like the way um, his reactions to some of to some of the things he said, and then his reaction when it didn't go that way. I thought he kind of uh, he kind of left us uh, hanging out there, but we had such great leadership in Messier and Kevin Lowe, and we had brought McTavish and mm -hmm. and uh, Buka Boom, and then Gravy, and we had such a good tight team that you know, like when when Mike was acting a certain way, the team you know kind of bonded over that at, at different times, and you know it didn't bring us any closer together, but we all went through similar reactions and you know just kept reminding each other because it, it wasn't it wasn't like he was riding me all the time and nobody else there were other other players that got the same type of treatment and a lot of players got shipped out um and the other players that he liked you know were brought in and neil smith did that because he wanted mike fully engaged you know for the for the playoffs and for the run so um but we got it done together and mike was this just as important as every the 20 guys that lace them up each day. And, and it could have gone, you know, if we had a weak link on the ice or a weak link behind the bench, we wouldn't have won. You know, uh, you mentioned Mc, you mentioned McTavish, Brian. Did anybody ever go to him and be like, hey, uh, hey Craig, you want to put a helmet on? It's pretty no, dangerous I, out here. I know. We thought it was crazy. You know, like, the, especially for younger guys like me that came into the league with n really nobody wearing helmets. I, I played with Guy Lafleur when he came out of retirement. <laughs> and he was really the only one besides when uh, Mac T came. And, and you know, Guy was already back out of the league by then. And, and Mac T was the last one. So it was strange watching him play in a game with no helmet. Yeah, but he stood out. And that's why uh, a lot of Ranger fans remember him as the guy that didn't wear a helmet. Of course, he was great on faceoffs and a great leader, all those different things. A uh, couple more here before we let you go, Brian. I really do appreciate your time. It's a thrill for me to be able to talk to you. It hurt me as a Ranger fan to have to see you get traded away from the Rangers toward the end of your Ranger career. How did you handle how everything went down before you were traded away? Terrible. I was, I was extremely hurt to be honest, because I was told that I'd be uh, retiring as a Ranger. And uh, as, as long as, uh, as certain management was there that, that I would be there. And so I was given no uh, heads up. Um, I was called on my 36th birthday and told I was traded. So I hung up the phone, started crying um, immediately. I was so hurt by it. Um, the, the flip side is I get treated so nice in Toronto. Um, it was a really nice experience, but um, even talking about it, there's, there's still some bitterness there, to be honest, uh, about that. But the experiences I had after that and the players I met and the friends I have um, were great. And but that that initial time, um, I was really hurt by it. Would the bitterness come from not being able to say that you're a lifelong ranger? 
No, just by not be given a heads up. You know, I was told one thing and then never because everybody, you know, getting traded is a part of professional sports. And um, unless you have a no movement clause or anything. But I thought because of the years I'd played there and the, the communication that was said to me before I signed my last contract, that I would at least I understand, you know, things can change. Um Yet the team can change and situations change. It's it's management's job to do the best they can um, for the organization. Um, so that's completely understandable. It was never it being addressed to me or um, told that we might be looking to move you. And is there any preferable spot? It was just a call, you know, close to the uh, deadline time. Um, telling me that I was traded. So I was hurt by it. Is there one person in particular, I forget, who was running things at the time that, that you're bitter with? Because, I mean, you had your number retired since. You worked for the Rangers recently. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but I don't really like going over it in person because I did. I did come back and work for a lot of the same people that were there. Um, even Jim Dolan, you know, I, I'd see him around, and he was always very respectful and uh, very, very nice to me, and he always was. When I was a player, I just the way it was handled, I thought was uh, was not the correct way that it should be handled. All right. And last one here for you, Brian. I don't know if you know this. Sam Rosen has said that this will be his final year in the booth. I, I Look, I grew up watching you guys, but I grew up watching Sam and J.D. back at the time. They're just to me as important as my Rangers soundtrack is watching you guys out there on the ice. What did Sam Rosen mean to you? Yeah, Sam, I mean, right, you know, he had my whole career. So my whole career as a New York Ranger, I was there. And then I, I did a little bit with him on TV when I was doing some uh, work for MSG there. And so whenever I see a highlight of one of my plays at a, a at an event when they introduce you, you know, it's Sam or JD, you know, that are talking about you. So he's completely connected. He's a good friend. Um, I'm glad he's going out while he's still um, at the top of his game, and he'll be able to enjoy um, watching from the outside a little bit more. And uh, instead of having to do the travel and do the full-time um, work that it takes and the preparation that it takes, but just to have him connected with any highlight in my career is tremendous. Yeah, we're all going to miss him, but enjoy this final run. And hopefully it ends the same way that your season in 1994 did. Maybe he could go out on top. Win yeah, the Stanley that, Cup. that would be good. And maybe you can get to the, the, the parade this time instead of just when we got <laughs> to the city hall, you can experience the ticker tape parade. You have fun at that parade? Was that wild for you guys oh back then? Oh, my gosh. It's probably, it's besides like getting through that game seven and you know you've won it, that's that's as much as a, a relief and a, a mix of emotions. The parade was was strictly awe and enjoyment. And I don't think there's one guy that hasn't said over and over that they, if we could go around the block and do it again, that that would be the favorite part of, of winning the Stanley Cup. Because it was, it was just an awe-inspiring thing and the amount of people and the waves of uh, applause going up the street on those floats was still shakes, gives me chills thinking about it. Yeah, and that one will last a lifetime. Yeah. And it might have to. I mean, we <laughs> haven't seen another one since. 30 freaking years, Brian. Right. Jeez. Know. We'll, we'll get it done. There you go. I like that. Celebrate with Brian. You go this Saturday. Join Mark Messier, Brian Leach, of course, the New York Rangers 1994 Stanley Cup championship team, Richter, Graves, Matteau, Mike Keenan will be there as well. Woodbridge Brewery, 33rd Main Street, or 33 Main Street in Woodbridge, New Jersey. That's this Saturday, September 21st. Visit HallOfFameSignings.com or CXStuff.com for details and to purchase tickets. Brian, I got to tell you, this is an honor. As a, as a kid who grew up watching those teams, you know, teenager loving you guys in 94 and then obviously beyond, this is a thrill to be able to talk to you. Thank you so much for the time today. Cheers. Thanks. 